Okay, time is not on our side, so I will launch right through and go to the, our text for today. That is Psalm 136. And we, in a sense, are continuing with our series of Anchored Through the Storm. And I've titled this message simply Thanksgiving. It's a Thanksgiving message. And I would like for us to give thanks to the Lord. And so without much ado, let us read our text and then unpack it this morning. It reads as follows, Psalm 136. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his steadfast love endures forever. And I'm going to ask you to, re to repeat that with me, the second part with me. Give thanks to the God of gods. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. To him who alone does great wonders. To him who, may, who by understanding made the heavens. To him who spread out the earth above the waters. To him who made the great lights. The sun to rule the day. The moon and stars to rule the night. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt. And brought Israel out from among them. With a strong hand and an outstretched arm. To him who divided the Red Sea in two. And made Israel pass through the midst of it. But overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea. To him who led the people through the wilderness. To him who struck down the great kings. And killed mighty kings. Sihon, king of the Amorites. And Og, king of Bashan. And gave their land as a heritage. A heritage to Israel, his servant. It is he who remembered us in our low estate. And rescued us from our foes. He who gives food to all flesh. Give thanks to the God of heaven. And this is the word of God. And so we are going to unpack this text under three headings. Number one, we are going to look at the call to give thanks unto God. Secondly, we are going to look at the actions or how God wants to show forth his loving kindness to us and the actions that he does to do that. And thirdly, we are going to look at the restoring grace of Almighty God. But before we do that, let's just contextualize our message by looking at the occasion of this psalm and when it was written. It was probably written immediately after the people of Israel came back from exile. And it was composed especially for the very first service that they were going to have immediately after exile. You can imagine the atmosphere must have been electric at that time as the people of God are seeing the faithfulness of God who is bringing them out. And you will see that recorded for us in the book of Ezra, chapter 3, verse 11. And that refrain is given, just the one sentence, give thanks unto the Lord, in verse 11, for his steadfast love endures forever. And the leaders at that time was uh, Zerubbabel and Ezra, and later on it was Nehemiah, as they were setting and reestablishing worship for the first time in Israel, uh, in Jerusalem, in worship to our God. And it seems to me that this particular statement is very, very significant in the nation of Israel. The first time that we see it recorded for us, it's in First Chronicles chapter 16. And the occasion there was David had gone and taken the Ark of the Covenant and brought it into Jerusalem. At that time, there was no temple. It wasn't built yet. And he brought it into the tent of meeting. And as he brought it there, he asked Asaph and other musicians to compose worship and psalms and praise to God. And we see this sentence at the very last sentence of the song that Asaph wrote. 
He says, give thanks unto the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever. And that context is important because you'll remember that the Ark of the Covenant, and this word seems to be connected with the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was taken after Israel was beaten by the Philistines. And after a while, because God judged them, they put the Ark of the Covenant in a, in a chariot and sent it to Israel. But it was, it was not in Jerusalem, and it stayed there for 20 years. And not long ago, we saw how after 20 years, Samuel went and erected a memorial stone and called it Ebenezer, saying, thus far, God has been with us. And then David tried to take the Ark of the Covenant, taking it to Jerusalem. He couldn't because somebody touched the Ark of the Covenant and died. And it was taken for three months to another guy. His name is Obed Edom. And when the covenant was there, God just blessed that guy's house. And after three years, three months, David heard that God is blessing Abed, Obed Edom because he, his, the, the Ark of the Covenant in his, in his home. And so that is why he went and took it to Jerusalem. The second time that we see this statement, and, and, and when that was sung, God came through. And the second time that we see that, that refrain, give thanks unto the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever, it's in Second Chronicles chapter 7. The occasion there was now the temple has been built through David's help, but it was built by Solomon. And when Solomon was consecrating the temple, bringing the Ark of the Covenant inside, and they were worshiping the Lord together, bringing the, the, the burnt offerings, the fire of God broke and consumed this offering. And the glory cloud of God covered the entire temple. And so the priests were not able to worship because the thick presence of God was in that place. So this seems to be a, a refrain, a statement that is said at very significant times in the history of the people of Israel. And therefore, in our history and in you and my life, we need to embrace those words and say, give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever. John Calvin, when he comments on this, a psalm, and in this verse, he says, it is repeated so many times because God wants us to know that a proper way of worshiping God and of praising Him is by recognizing that everything that God gives to you, He gives it to you because of who He is, because of His steadfast, not because of who you are, <laughs> but because of who He is. And so this brings us to our first point, the call to give thanks unto our God. You see that this is not a suggestion, but it is an instruction. We are commanded, and it is repeated four times in verse 1, in verse 2, in verse 3, and in the last verse we see, give thanks unto God. So in terms of the structure of this psalm, We've got a call to give thanks to the Lord at the beginning and at the end. And in the middle of the psalm, we have got the causes or the reasons or the grounds of our giving thanks unto God. What does this word give thanks mean? A gentleman by the name of Derek Kidner says the following about it, the Hebrew word that we get the word give thanks from. He says it means to confess or acknowledge and thus calls to thoughtful worship, spelling out what we know or found of God's glory and God's deeds. You realize when you look at this definition that the, to properly give thanks unto God, two things need to happen. Your head needs to be involved. There is a confession, there is an acknowledgement, there is thoughtful worship. And the second thing that needs to happen to give thanks to God aright is that your heart must be involved in it. 
you are not just reciting from your head what God has done, but there is a sense in which your heart is affected by what it is that you are saying unto God. You know something of his glory, you know something of his deeds, and it affects your heart, therefore spilling out in praise and worship unto him. G.K. Chesterton says the following, he says, Thanks are the highest form of thought. So again, we see the, the thought is involved. It is the highest form of thought, and gratitude is happiness doubled by wonder. So there is thinking, and there is admiration and wonder and gratitude at the depths of our hearts. And when you bring the head and heart together in that way, then God is rightly worshipped. God is not interested in us just praising him with our lips and our hearts being far removed. God doesn't just want us to know him with our heads and not love him with our hearts. God doesn't just want us to have theology without what theologians call doxology. Your theology must lead you to doxology, to praise and glory and honor unto God. But the interesting thing about the, the reasons that are given in this call to give thanks unto God is that it is, this, this giving thanks to God is grounded on two things, really on God, on one thing. Two things about one thing. Two aspects of one thing. He says we must give thanks unto God. Why? For He is good. We give thanks to God because of who God is. We give thanks to God because of His uniqueness. His goodness to us. Before you look at what He has done for you, you look at God himself and you say, God, you are good in yourself. And then secondly, the reason that he's giving as a call to give thanks is the supremacy of God. Verse 2 says, give thanks to the God of gods. He says, God is large and in charge. He is the God of of gods, not that there is other gods, but it's, he's saying, I know that other nations around Israel are worshiping what the, the so-called gods, but he's saying, but God is God above them. Verse 3 says, give thanks to the Lord of lords, looking at the supremacy of God. And the last verse, verse 26 says, give thanks to the God of of heaven, the transcendent God, the sovereign God, the high God. So we give praise unto God, and we are called to give thanks unto him, really because of who he is, before we look at what he has done for us. And uh, again, I think it was Derek Kidner, or Stephen Charnock, speaking about goodness. This is how he defines it. He says, God is only originally good. Good of himself. We're looking at the uniqueness of God here. All created goodness is a rivulet. It's a tributary. It's a, it's a river that flows from this fountain of goodness, which is God himself. But the divine goodness has no spring. In other words, God doesn't get his goodness from anything outside of himself. He is good and he is the origin and fountain and he is infinitely good and he is essentially good. There is nothing but good in God himself and God is unchangeably good. He is the author of goodness itself. God depends on no other for his goodness. He has it in and of himself. And if you were to ask Stephen Charnock, what then is goodness? He will say, it is God's inclination to deal well and bountifully with his creatures. You need to let that sink in your head and heart. Do you believe that? That God is good, that God is inclined to deal well with you, 
and that God is inclined to do bountifully. I love that word, bounty. That's riches. God is inclined to be, ben- to be our benefactor. That is his very nature of God. We need to believe that. And he's saying it because the enemy wants to attack us. And he wants to deceive us, especially because we tend to look and define God based on our circumstances. And so when we look at what happens to us, we say, where are you, God? And we question God's goodness based on what is happening to us. And so the psalmist is saying, God is good. God is inclined to deal well with you and bountifully with you. James, in 1 verse 17, he says, Do not be deceived, brothers. He says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Let the truth marinate in your heart that God is good, that God is for you, that God is well disposed towards you. And once you know that and you have that conviction about the nature of God, that He is that good, then let that affect your emotions and begin to pour praise and glory and honor unto God. Say, God, I praise you for you are good. And not only are you good, but you have this thing called loving kindness, chesed in Hebrew. It is the covenant love that God sets upon us. His his chesed endures forever. This was very interesting that the Jews were singing this at the time where they should have been questioning the chesed of God, the loving kindness of God, and the goodness of God. They've been exiled into Babylon. For many years, at least 70 years, they've not been able to worship in Israel. The temple has been destroyed and and desecrated. And the first thing they do when they come back from exile, they say, God, whatever happened to us, it was not because you changed. It was because we changed. We give thanks unto you, for you are good. And your steadfast love endures forever. I pray that I will be that kind of a person who will be able in the midst of crisis, in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of everything going wrong in my life, that I will be able to say, God, I give thanks unto you for you are good. And your steadfast love endures forever. And then we then come to our point number two. Let's look at how God reveals his loving kindness to his people. We are now looking at how he uses his great power to benefit us and to show us his loving kindness. This psalm does it in three ways. Number one, It says God shows his loving kindness towards us in creation by displaying his power in creation. And I'll come back to unpack that. And we see that in verse 4 to verse 9. And then secondly, God shows his love towards us by his power in redemption when he redeems us. Thirdly, God shows His loving kindness to us towards us by the supremacy of his power in his providence towards us. We will just go very briefly over this. Did you see that verse 4 to verse 9? It's like a reconfiguration or recontextualization of the book of Genesis. He's talking really about creation. He says, God who made the heavens and the earth. Doesn't he say that? Verse 4. He who, do, who alone does great wonders, uh, to him who by understanding made the heavens, and to him who spread out the earth above the waters, to him who made the great lights, the sun to rule over the day, and the moon 
and stars to rule over the night. It's looking at God displaying his great power, his supremacy by creating. And, and here's the great revelation. The Jews knew this. God created everything. But here's a new revelation. The new revelation is God did that to show you his loving kindness. In other words, when you wake up in the morning and you see the sun, you need to see it as God's love letter to you. <laughs> he created those things to show forth his loving kindness towards you. When you feel the breeze washing over your face as you are walking in, uh, at, the, at the sea, at the beach, you need to see it as God's love letter towards you. He did those things because his loving kindness endures forever. We need to stop complaining. I hear people, when it's hot, we are complaining. When it's cold, we are complaining. When it's windy, we are complaining. When it's cool, we are complaining. I could be at the beach now. Now it's cool. I wish it was hot. <laughs> we need to look at these things and say, God, you display your power in creation to show me your loving kindness towards me. But secondly, if this is great, this second point is even greater. He's telling us that God displays his loving kindness towards us through redemption. And redemption is a difficult one because there is a mixture of judgment. Uh, when, when somebody rescues you and, and delivers you, if they are really worth their soul, they are going to kill somebody. They are going to shoot somebody in order to rescue you. And this is what God did here. We are told that he sorted out the firstborn in Egypt. The firstborn sons died in Egypt. When God was redeeming the people of Israel from their hands. God used his mighty hand and his outstretched arm in redeeming them. In the ten plagues that he visited against Egypt. God divided the sea. God destroyed Pharaoh's chariots even as he was redeeming his people. And this is a picture for you and I as well. But here's the story. When God creates the first point that we must give thanks to God for creation, it costs him absolutely nothing. He is all powerful. He just spoke it all into existence. Didn't break a sweat. But when God redeems us, it costed him everything. He sent his very heart. He sent his son to die so that you would be rescued. It is almost as if God is saying, you and I are more valuable than his son because the son must die so that you might live. But that would be a wrong way of looking at it. Christ's death for us is not a testimony to our value. It is a testimony to the riches of God's love. God says, I'm paying an unlimited price to save somebody of limited value. To show forth his loving kindness towards us. And then thirdly, God shows his loving kindness towards us through his providential care. You would see that he uh, kept the people of Israel in the wilderness. And he provided them in the wilderness. And then he dealt with the guy called Sihon, the king of the Amorites. You see that story in the book of Numbers. That guy didn't need to die. Moses comes to him and says, Sihon, king of the Amorites, all I need to do is to pass safely. I'm asking for safe passage. I'm going to Canaan land. I'm not coming to your land. I'm going to Canaan. Give me a safe passage. And this guy says, yeah. And, and he deceived him. And as Moses was going, he wanted to attack him. And God says, okay, turn around and sought Sihon. He was killed. And his land was taken because of his deception. And then King Og, it's another king that we hear of in the book of Numbers. He was the last giant from the tribe of Goliath. 
a big man, strong man, God sorted him out. And God gave their land as an inheritance to the people of Israel to show forth his providential care for his people. And this is a testimony for you and I, that God will, who has saved you by his mighty hand, he will keep you right to the end. God says the safe passage for you. <laughs> Heaven is guaranteed to you. I will protect providentially your life. And I will deal with all your enemies until you rest and you get your heritage in me. But lastly, and I put this in the separate category because it's, I think it's important in the context of this psalm, God's restoring grace. That's the last point. I started off by saying that the nation of Israel had been blessed because they had various kings, some of whom worshipped and served God. And as they served God, God blessed the nation. But they also had wicked kings who abandoned God and served other gods. And when they did, God abandoned them and gave them up. Uh, to be exiled and for the temple to be destroyed. But at their lowest point, when they were completely down and out, God remembered his covenant and God restored them. That verse, um, he says, verse 24, he says, he who, uh, not 24, verse 23, it is he who remembered us in our low estate because of our own sins. And I want to say to you today, maybe you have sinned and maybe you look at yourself and you say, I'm beyond redemption. There is no hope for me. If I look at my life and I look at the rebellion inside of me, God will never have mercy on me. I give up on me because I look at all the sins in my life. I'm here to say to you, the grace of God is a restoring grace. There is hope for you. Look to him. It is not about you. It is about God's loving kindness. It's about who he is. He's good. And when you, when you think you're lost and you say, I've sinned, I've, I've blown it, I want you to look away from your sins and away from you and your actions. But I want you to look at God and give thanks unto him and say, God, you are good and your steadfast love endures for all generations. I want to close with this and I'm going to give you a little bit of a homework. He, he ends this psalm by talking about the sovereignty of God, that God is above all. This is an encouragement to those who think you've got enemies who are very, very powerful. And the psalmist says, God is supreme and he's above and he's sovereign. He's, he's able to sort out all of your enemies. Give thanks to the God of heaven. The God is exalted above all for his steadfast love endures forever. Here the, here's the challenge I want to give you. Number one, I want you to not complain. <laughs> just for one month, just take this challenge. Just say, I'm going to embrace this thing. and I'm going to train my mind and my heart to give thanks unto God because he is good and because his steadfast love endures forever. Even when a taxi uh, cuts you out, <laughs> I want you to look at it and say, I give thanks to the Lord for he is good. And his steadfast love endures forever. Even when it is hot, you say, God, this is your love letter to me. You created this thing because your steadfast love endures forever. Even when your boss is impossible, yeah, I want you to look at him and say, God, I give thanks unto you because you're good. And your steadfast love endures forever. Can we, do we agree on that? Just one month? 
um, the, the the month is the month is new. It's only it's only the the, the what is it, the third or fourth today. <laughs> I'll give you those four days. Uh, just 20 odd days of just saying, this month in December, I'm not going to complain. Secondly, I want you to journal every single day this month, just this month only. This is a, a Black Friday kind of special. <laughs> <laughs> just this month, journal every single day what it is that you are thankful for each day. You go home, you have your work, go home, and just think of maybe one, two, or three things to say. God, I thank you for, for these two or these three things today. Will we do that? Let us give thanks to the God of heaven <laughs> for his mercy endures forever. And so, Lord, we want to thank you today. This is our thanksgiving Sunday, and we want to make this a thanksgiving month as we give praise and glory unto you, seeing your goodness in the small things in life and letting those things whisper to us, telling us about your steadfast love towards us. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. The Lord bless you.